In this community, we talk a lot about getting out of our own way and into action around our big ideas. And my guest today is no stranger to that. Terry Brassard Williams believes that leaders turn moments into movements. Throughout her career as an author, broadcast journalist, press secretary, and lobbyist, Terry has turned community service into an art form that has impacted millions of lives. In addition to her day job as a lobbyist, Terry is focused on paying it forward, encouraging and building up others who strive to create meaningful and groundbreaking change. She shares her four-step strategy for how all of us can turn moments into full-blown movements, why movements are never started alone, and how to find your unique role within one. have you tuning in today. I have just spent a little time before we hit record getting to know today's guest and I feel like we're already fast friends. My cheeks already hurt from smiling. (laughs) So Terry, thank you so much for sharing space and bringing your energy to our powerhouse women tribe today. Oh, thank you so much, Lindsay, for having me here. I feel like I've known you like all my life. It it's like that immediate connection when you meet people who have similar energy and you can just vibe off of one another. So uh, we decided we should hit record before we, you know, have all of the good conversation offline. So um, <laughs> I would love if you would even just start out for those who do not know you, who don't know the breadth of work that you have really done. I mean, you've done everything from you ha- you're an author, you have a book, you've been a broadcast journalist, press secretary, lobbyist, just to name a few how in the world did you wake up as a little girl and say, I'm just going to take over the world? Or how did this amazing career of yours really take shape? I, I always say that I do things with faith and fortitude. And I think so much of it is tied to you of my family. I am a true Southern belle. And we have this attitude that we can do anything. And my parents definitely instilled that in me. But, you know, I... Where I am now is not really where I thought I would be. I I was going to be Barbara Walters and started working in television at 16 and spent all of my high school years and college years at a television station. And um, life just takes you on this incredible journey. And so what was, you know, the road road A ended up definitely being like road, like Y for me. Um, But it's, it's been an incredible ride and every step there's one thing that has resonated with me and that's being able to empower people with information to do good in their community. And I love what you do because you say that you're not meant to do anything alone. And so when you have that information and the power of community, you, you can really do good in the world. Yeah. Which ties in perfectly to your message about turning moments into movements. So I would love to hear what inspired that, what inspired that mission of yours and really how that now is taking shape in terms of your, you offering your gifts to the world. So is there a cool story behind it? How did you decide (laughs) that you were going to be known for, you know, really teaching leaders how to do this? I I go back to my family. Yeah. So my grandparents were incredible humans as are my, my, my parents and everyone in my family. And there was a time when my grandparents, um, had to drive really far to go to church. And it was during a segregated period of the world and they were lucky enough to have a car, but not everyone was lucky enough to have the car. And sometimes when times were hard, they would walk because gas was expensive. So they decided to build a church closer to their home. And I say that they were the leaders that turned that moment into movement with community. And so they built this incredible church. And my parents spent time there. They started a youth group there. It was one of the first places that I volunteered. And the things that I learned from them time and time again, you know, transcended any opportunity that I had in life. So as I got older and I started thinking about what made me um, 
a very humble yet successful lobbyist. It was being that leader that would just raise my hand and say like, I got this, I'm going to do this. I'm going to turn this moment into a movement. And it goes back to, I never did anything alone, but I was the one that was like, you know, we got this, you guys come on. Um, And so it's just, it's something that has fueled me all along. And the more that I talk to people about their why and their how, it also resonated with them. So it truly has been a tenant in my life, even before I recognize it to be. Yeah. I love how you identified though, that there's almost always one person who is bold enough to either speak up first or be the one to raise their hand and say, okay, I'm going to bring the people together who also see that this is a challenge or this is a problem, but that they, you say, you know, movements aren't started alone, which is so in line. So talk a little bit about that process. You know, I think a lot of us right now are, are waking up to a deeper, a deeper purpose, a deeper impact, you know, with the way our world is changing so much, where does that movement start? What does it feel like? like within you? How do you know if you're really being tapped to step up and maybe be one of these courageous people to start a movement, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You just gave me goosebumps for a lot of reasons. I I always say that they also, the movements also find you, right? It's like when that one thing, just you can't stop thinking about it. And it's something that others ignore, but it's something that always finds itself back to you. Um, I really do feel like the universe calls you to do it. And sometimes you might be f- totally afraid, you know, and other times you might just be really confident, but it's going to always find its way to you. And, and so I say there are four things that you have to do to really get a movement started, but there's also this movement inside of you. So I like that you asked that. Um, and so there, there are also things that you have to have within yourself to say that I'm ready, you know, um, I also believe that you might feel called to start a movement, but sometimes you might be the person to amplify the movement or mm-hmm. to support that movement. Um, you know, right now there are like three different things that I'm helping with, but I am not that leader for everyone. Sometimes I just got to be in the choir. And, and so I think when you ask, like, what are the things that you need to be ready? One, you have to be like, fearless, but not from a a space of where like you're not afraid of everything. Sometimes fear really is insightful and it can cue you into some things that you need to pay attention to, but you have to be fearless in a way that you're not afraid to fail forward and to fail fast, (laughs) you know, um, just the quicker you can fail, the more that you can figure things out. And, and quite honestly, sometimes that makes you appear to be human and authentic. So people are drawn to that and they'll come along and they'll want to help you because you're not that overly confident person that wants to, you know, take all the credit or do it on your own. I also think that you got to be healthy. And so that's one thing that I love about you, Lindsay, and that I hope that you can get me to commit a little deeper is that that wellness piece, you know, um, over the last year, I have had some crazy things happen in my life from having a a concussion that um, kept me out of work for some time to wanting to double down on being more healthy and losing weight and getting more active. And I was a leader that kept a movement moving. But now that I'm on the other side of being a little more healthy, I find my focus to come easier. Um, Things are just coming more crisp and I feel better about myself and just the way that I move in in the world. And so that that whole whole piece of you is really important. Um, And I also think that you have to come from a place of humility and authenticity and just being real. you know, when I think about myself as a young leader, oftentimes I, I did not have it together. I still don't ever have it together, you know, but I, I am happy to say today that I don't have it together. Whereas before I was really just trying to hold everything super tight and control it. And, and so I might have a day that was one off, but it was because I wasn't being real with myself and those that I was trying to serve. And so I think once you have those th- three ingredients inside, it sets you in this place where you can truly be the leader that you need to be. And then you can execute some other things that are just part of a formula to help you succeed. Yeah. Okay. Well, I love the part that I dotted down as you were talking is that piece about 
fear. And I, I do think often I see it in myself. I've seen it in women around me that there's this idea that we should feel distant from fear before we can take that first step. But I love how you redefined fearlessness to be specific to just not fearful of failing and failing forward versus not having any fear at all, which mm. I believe if we're doing something big and worthy of our life, there is going to be a measure of, you know, something we might label fear, some kind of feeling yeah. on the inside. So what has that looked like for you? Can you remember a time when you took a really bold step, a really brave step, and the fear was real? Yes. <laughs> like what, what's like the first example that pops into your mind? I mean, it's so easy for me to go to the lobbying space, but I'll, but that would be an answer that was so surface. So I'll go a little deeper, which is something that um, I'm learning to do more and I have to say, you know, you, you're an author and I don't know if you had the same experience, but when you start to write a book, it's this thing that you feel called to do and you know, you have to do it, but then you're like, am I really supposed to do it? And who's going to pick this up and read it? You know? Um, and it is a head game. You have to tell yourself, you have to be your own like hype girl, you know, and be like, you got this, you're being called to this for a reason. And you just have to tell the story. And if you tell the story, others will come along. And I have to tell you, the more I go deeper into the story, but the more that I show up as my whole self and infuse the things that make me scared, but also infuse the things that make me so comfortable in my own skin, I get closer to being where I'm supposed to be. And I know that because then more opportunities come. There'll be a person that I'll, I'll meet and it's the person who has an answer to something that I've been just going back and forth on. Um, or yeah. an opportunity to talk to someone like you, like I've just been thinking of, you know, who else out there in the world might have similar, you know, beliefs and just core values and who I needed to meet. And then here you are, you show up. And I, that is one thing that is consistent when you lean into fear. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm glad that you went there. I was wondering as an author, if you had experienced that too, there's something about putting a piece of your heart and soul out into the world for people to do with it what they will. It yeah. was the most visceral experience I had ever had with fear or being in my own way, but also the best things in my life have come on the other side of it. And Tell now me, I need to hear it. <laughs> oh, I'm like weak. I will be your other hype girl reminding you of all the goodness that's coming your way because it is, I think once we take that, that brave step and you've done it in other areas for me, the book was actually one of the first where I actually had an anchor to say, okay, that was really scary. And I cried my way through most of the process, but look at what came on the other side. Yeah. Like my life wouldn't look this way. So I think for those of you listening, just to know that the first time you step into that fear, it's gonna, it's gonna feel awful. It might actually feel like you're dying at some points. I was sure <laughs> I might be dying, but that the best, the best things, the things right now you can't even imagine ways that your message are, is going to be used to impact lives that you never imagined. Those things don't come on until you've actually taken the step of faith, right? That's and leave right. that fear. And I'm so proud of you for doing it. I want to oh, hear a little you. bit more about the book since we're talking about it. Um, find your fire is the name, which I'm obsessed with. Tell us what inspired it, what it's about, all the things. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love that you just said all the things. I use that like all the time. <laughs> but so, you know, when I really thought about my time as a lobbyist, and this is a story that I'm just starting to own, but for a long time, I didn't want to tell it out of fear of being judged and not taken seriously. You know, so I, my professional career started in television and I had a hot minute at a nonprofit and then worked as a press secretary for U.S. Senate candidate. It was for a really big, important race and we lost. And I had to find a job. I graduated from college three years early, like, and I had a full-time job before I graduated. Like there was always a plan, but this time there was not. And so I had 
to really pull it together quickly. And in talking to my mentors, one suggested that I should become a lobbyist. I'd never met a lobbyist. The only lobbyist I knew, and this is like keeping it a hundred, like you can fact check it, was L Woods in Legally Blonde 2. I love L saves the dogs. In reference. Decent, right? Yes, we just became best friends right there. <laughs> that that was my the only lobbyist I'd ever met. Yeah. And I had not been to a capital since fifth grade for a field trip where I bought like this mechanical pencil type thingy. And here I am considering being a lobbyist. So I started looking for a job in the state that I lived in at the time, South Carolina, and my home state of Louisiana. Three months later, I'm walking through the halls of a Capitol with a badge that says like, you're a lobbyist in a briefcase, you know, get a girl. And the rest is history. You know, when I was at the Louisiana State Capitol, I never lost a bill. And it was all about finding my fire and really understanding what was inside of me that would allow me to be my best and taking things from along my journey that would allow me to show up as my best every day. And so I truly think if you want to be a leader that will turn a moment into a movement, there are four easy things that will happen every time that you will find success. Um, and a lot of it is innate in all of us. We all have it. Um, and a lot of it comes down to our formula. And I also think the one thing that we can never, ever forget is you don't need a pedigree to do anything in life. People will tell you that you might need, you know, a fancy degree or training to become a lobbyist. And this girl had only watched Legally Blonde too. <laughs> I love it. I love, I don't know how many of us can probably relate to watching those movies and thinking, heck yeah, I could be a lawyer or I could be a lobbyist. <laughs> if she can do it, I can, right? In the movies. Um, I love that example so much. And you've referenced your four-part strategy a few times. I think that would be, I love any time we can make something tangible because for for my journey, I know it took a little while for me to wake up to my own potential in stepping up and, and leading a, a movement, right? If you look at powerhouse women, it's a business, but it's really a movement for women. And it took a little while for me to really own that. But where I got my confidence was from following plans that had been laid out before me, examples of women who'd gone before me. So I feel I, I would love to hear if you're willing to share the, the four-part strategy for those who might be really starting to just wake up to that calling for something more or a big idea that they have something they can follow until they yeah. feel that sense of confidence that we know will come as they move forward. Absolutely. So I call it the fire starter formula and a fire starter is very much a powerhouse woman. They're like almost exact, you know, same, definitely same principles. And I can't help but wonder if some of these things you used as you moved forward, um, because there's so, I, I find time and time again, there's so much that is similar to those of us that know how to move in this space. We just might all call them something different. But for me, when I was creating movements, um, no matter if it was something that was philanthropic, like helping a nonprofit start a fundraiser, or if it was something in the policy space, like beginning to pass a law, or even if it was something tied to mission building, like, you know, just helping my friends get together to figure out what they want to do in life. And, the, you know, every December when we, we do those great charts of what we want to have in the year, the vision boards, it's kind of all the same. So, you know, first you are going to find that cause or what inspires you. You know, if you're in business, what is that one service that you want to provide? And then you will find a collective of people. You don't want to build a movement alone. Just like you, you, you say, it, you know, as well for powerhouse, you cannot do it by yourself. So who are the people that have the same core values and principles as you do? If they don't, they are like not on your bus. They're only going to give you a flat tire. They're not going to keep the bus moving. They're not going to keep that movement moving. Then you're going to figure out how are you going to communicate? How are you going to tell your story? The story is what inspires people. It's what allows people to follow you because they either see a little bit of themselves in the movement or a little bit of themselves in your business or a little bit of themselves in you as a leader, as a powerhouse woman. And then last, you're going to really create the change that you want to see. And that's where you're going to take your bullet points and maybe your map and actually create 
a true plan and do the work. And when you do the work, that's where it gets really messy. So you want to lean on that collective and the people that you have at the table to let you know if you're off base, if you need to tweak things a little bit, tighten the message up. Um, but they will carry you, carry you the entire way. Um, and so in Find Your Fire, I break it down far more into great detail and provide some worksheets. Um, but I, I think those things are, are truly things that translate to everything in life. If it's you wanting to start a business or joining a nonprofit board or starting your own movement. And if people go to terrybwilliams.com, um, Terry B. Williams, like, be the boy.com. There is a downloadable worksheet that they can get that it's actually a movement maker map that will allow them to start that process. Oh, I love that. I love a good written handout, something I can color code and just yes. let my, my brain just unleash and go for it. So I love that. And it's as I'm listening to you share, I'm thinking about how much, I mean, I, I only have experience building a business. I've never had experience getting a bill passed or, you know, all the amazing work that you've done, but it really is the same, isn't it? It is, you know, it's the impact piece and driving forward and rallying people for that same cause. I, I love that perspective so much because I think within our community, the way that people are expressing you know, the, their impact, the movements that they're starting might start in the home or they might start on Capitol Hill or in a business somewhere, but to realize that we really are all the same and we really are all using the gifts and talents that we've been gifted. It's so, that is so cool. I love how you put yeah. that together. Well, and the, the thing about it is if you figure out one time, you know, then you can replicate it in every space in life. And so that's why I've really been honest. This is, these are tools that I have used no matter what I do career in my career, or no matter what I do when I build a movement to pass a bill. Um, and so, you know, like I, I often use makeup germs because I, um, I love to paint and like makeup is like painting, but when you have that blank ca canvas of, you know, building out your smoky eye, you know, it's like you're, you're building the layers and the yeah. layers of those four principles are very much the same. And once you learn how to do that smoky eye, you can change the color, right? It's, it's all going to happen just the same. But, um, and so I think if we can just empower ourselves by understanding the work that we do matters and the work that we do will end up being consistent if we are true to ourselves and for things that we need to do. Um, the rest is easy peasy. Yeah. It always comes. Oh, it's so good. And I, I love that you have the formula that people can follow. Um, we, I feel like we almost maybe went out of order because I'd love to talk about the other piece that you brought up earlier about the movement within mm. and Am I correct in assuming that that's really almost where it has to start, isn't it? It does. It, I will say it's, it definitely starts within, you know, but I didn't always have it together as yeah. I was building these movements. Um, I talk a lot on my blog about where I am now versus where I was before. And so before I definitely excelled, but I was on this hamster wheel you know, life was moving so fast. I was saying yes to everyone, saying yes to everything, but saying no to myself. And so I was showing up, crushing all the goals, getting all these awards and accolades. I don't even know where those awards are today. If you ask me, where's my undergraduate degree? I don't even know. Oh my gosh. Same. You know, because I was so fun. Right. You get to focus on what comes next. Right. And so what I, what I know now is I've, I've fueled the movement within more you know, before I was like trying to throw these little pieces of Kindle <laughs> to like get them going. Um, but now I like really, I get the big logs. Let, let's fuel that baby. Let, let's find the fire within. And I am in this space where I am not anxious. I am not tense. I'm not striving for perfection. I'm looking to have fun. I'm looking to build deeper relationships and things aren't transactional. So when we really focus on being our whole self um, and truly, you know, 
being a leader, and I use that term as more of a place of giving ourselves authority instead of waiting for others to give it to us. But when we focus on really being that leader and feeding what's inside, we just show up differently. Um, And things come quicker. They come easier. I'm no longer on that hamster wheel. You know, I am just a very different person. And then the universe reacts to that because it's like this magnetic force. Um, And the beauty of it is something that I truly cannot describe. Yes. Oh, you, you painted such a beautiful picture of what that feels like. And even back to the point about not doing it alone, I think the right people come along as we're focusing on that inner work and what it takes in order, in order to step into the next phase of who we need to become in order to carry out this move, whatever you call it, a movement, a passion project, a business. Yes. It's so, so important. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know, especially with your experience, you know, working at the government level right now in our world, there are so many movements happening and so many important movements um, that are carrying on or getting new attention. There's people waking up to the difference that they can make. And a lot of people are feeling, um, I've heard comments of, gosh, I just don't know what to do. There's, you know, if we look at racial inequality, it's such a big issue. Where do we start? Mm -hmm. What, what is your advice for people who want to be an active part of, you know, of any movement, or we can talk even specifically about that one of answering that question for themselves. What can I do? I want to be a part. Maybe I want to be in the choir. I love that analogy before, but what, where do I start? What do I do? Gosh. I need like a whole hour just on that. (laughs) But I think there's a place for all of us. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any of us thought that we would be able to be a part of something that generations after us would read about in a history book. Sure, we thought we'd talk about iPhones and technology, right? But will we talk about a reset of our values of who we are as people which transcends to who we are as a country in the world. What an incredible opportunity, you know, and I really believe that. And and so I I think there's a space for all of us. We might be someone that wants to start the movement. We might be someone that wants to amplify it or someone that just wants to support, but there are also different phases and I'll come back to the different ways that we can, we can start it. But, you know, you might be someone that just wants to, help with philanthropy. You might want to donate to a cause. I think there's a place for that. You might be someone who wants to participate, um, show up for a rally, show up for a conversation on what's happening in the world. Then you might be someone that wants to actually change policy, you know, for all of perpetuity. So things are never the same. There's a space for all of us. And there's a space for those of us that are still processing and want to learn and just learn right? And there is also a space for those of us that want to take a back seat and just be inactive. You know, I hope it's a time where we all find something to do, but it's totally okay to be inactive. There's no judgment there. and We should not make anyone feel that they are less important because that's where they need to be today. But I think when you talk specifically around the opportunity we have to rewrite um, the history of systemic racism, it is something that is truly a passion of mine. And I've been thinking about my place. Um, and I, I don't think that this is a, a, a time where I'll be a person that will um, start a movement like on the front lines, like starting a protest or a rally. Um, this is a time where I just want to share my experience and amplify the work that those people are doing. I, I say this often. Well, I say this often the last two months, but I am the daughter of the perceived desegregated South. I grew up in Lafayette, Louisiana, and we think that segregation ended in the 60s, but I attended a prom in 1997, and on that day, there was a, we, the, my date and I went to the white prom, and then we went to the black prom, and that was in the 90s. I'm, I just dated myself there, but- um, <laughs> We're not going to do the math. <laughs> But 
those things still exist. So if I can share some of the experiences that I've had of when um, systems might have failed me, even as a person of privilege from the way that I talk to the way that I look from playing the violin or, or, you know, having um, very recent graduated from an Ivy League and there's still experiences that I've had where the system has failed me, that might help one person see things differently. Just yeah. one. That, and that's enough. You know, Or I might be able to just share the words that might resonate with someone where it will click for them and they will learn the right words for them to be that person at a table as an ally. That person that shows up and advocates for someone when they're not in their room, which is the most important time. And so that's where I see my, my role in this movement, but there truly is a space for all of us. So I often tell people, the one thing you can do while you're trying to figure it out is to listen, listen to people's stories, then learn what are the opportunities that you can take, um, you know, small or big, And then express empathy. And I always say express empathy because it's the first action, right? When you hear action, that could be a little intimidating. But if you say, just express empathy and say, I hear you, I understand, I didn't know that existed, you've already taken the first step. And so I'll I'll put a pin in it there and pause, but those are just some of my thoughts about this incredible opportunity we have to reshape our country and the movement inside of all of us. Yes, you you put that in such a beautiful way and created so much space for people to participate in whatever big or small way they see in front of them. And I can't thank you enough for just the way you framed that because I think whether we're talking about fighting against systemic racism or any issue that is important to those of you listening, I think it's important to realize there are so many different roles And each of us are gifted with a different perspective, a different story, different gifts for a purpose. And you so eloquently really laid that out because it it is a movement that's bigger than any one of us. And I just thank you so much for sharing your perspective and for that, for that outlook on it, because that that's a new way of looking at the current conversation that really helped me see so much potential for all of us. Yeah, and I believe it's really an opportunity to have a self-assessment and think about how can I play the biggest role? And that biggest role might not be, you know, on the front lines. But for me, I have, I've worked on this for a lot of of a good chunk of my life. Um, And I stand along the side of so many of my friends that are, you know, truly organizing and on the ground but I also know my superpower for today um, and where they need me because I might feel a void for them. And so we have to be honest about where we are in our life's journey, about how we can really allow others to see themselves in us. Um, And so it's all very strategic. It's all very intentional. But when you do it, I always say this, when you do it with a good heart and a good work ethic, because if we're going to do this work, we, we got to approach it like we would, you know, <laughs> a performance review at work. Um, you know, anything that we're doing as we're building a plan and a business, we got to have that strong work ethic, even for these conversations we have within our country. And we do it with good intention. We will not fail. Mm. And so that's something I really believe. Oh my goodness. I love that. Um, Gosh, so much I want to ask you right now. I I would love to hear, as we start to really wrap this whole conversation up with a bow, what your hope is for the book for Find Your Fire. What do you hope to see as the ripple effect from that message? I have a bow. <laughs> Look at you. We Let's actually start. are tying this with a bow. We can tie it with a bow. So... I really want people to be inspired. So often we read in history books, you know, about Rosa Parks or about the first woman that walked on the moon, you know, or about Marie Curie who like, you know, did incredible things in in the science field, but we never see ourselves in them. 
you know, so I did something again, really strategic, really intentional. I want all of us to see something in ourselves that that is within a fire starter, someone who has done something great in the world. And so I looked at everyday individuals who led movements, everyday humans that have failed. And I'm telling their stories, but also using the fire starter formula so that we can see how we can do the same. And so I hope it's my true intention that everyone picks it up and sees something in themselves, but also sees how they can get it done. And um, I want to meet these people that read Find Your Fire. I want to hear their successes. I want to cheer them on. And so it's truly my hope that I can create a community of people um, that are at the table and that are helping to solve some of the world's most largest problems. And we're building that community because you do not do it alone. As you say, Lindsay, you do not do yes. it alone. <laughs> I love it. I mean, it really just ties together so perfectly with everything we talk about on this platform, at our events, in our community. And so I know people are going to be wondering where they can find the book, when they can find it. And then of course, where they can connect with you so they can share their own personal experiences once they get a chance to read it. Yes. Okay. So we're like in the final stages. This is like these are like all Look my notes it. and tabs. <laughs> um, it's so beautiful. That cover oh, is so you. beautiful. Thank you. I do. I, it's one thing that you have this head game about, right? It's the cover, but, um, it's any day now. I, I have not picked a launch date. Um, but I will definitely let you know, it'll either be the last week of July, or the first week of August. And we are at the, f- this is the first full week of July that we're talking. I have to like mark time in my head. Um, but I will definitely let you know. It'll be on Amazon um, and everywhere that you can get a book. Um, and right now you could sign up for an update at terrybwilliams.com. We'll shoot out information. Um, and for those of those people who do sign up for an update, I promise like some incredible treat in the mail with like glitter. And if I can pack a unicorn in there, I will. But just <laughs> I want this to be fun for everyone because this has been a gift to me um, and I I want it to be a gift for for everyone. But I am always at terrybwilliams.com writing about the things that are in my head and my heart. Um, And right now there's a whole lot to talk about as well as on Instagram at terrybwilliams and Twitter and Facebook. Um, But if you type out Terry B. Williams or Terry Broussard Williams, you will definitely be able to find me. And it's Terry with an I. We will, of course, link all of it in the show notes. So it's super easy to find. But my goodness, I mean, your light is so bright. It's undeniable. And I cannot. Maybe we should say your fire. Maybe it's not just your light. It's your fire. Snap. Yeah. I've never thought of that. I'll always say pack light, bring light, be the light for others. But man, you're right. I'm going to rewrite that. Yep. (laughs) Well, I know I cannot wait to get the book. I cannot wait to share it with our community. This episode will probably air right around the time. So go and jump onto Amazon, find a copy, grab a copy, and then um, share with us, share what you, what movement is sparking within you and let us know what you took away from this conversation, what I always love to challenge people to be bold and and share that big idea that's kind of freaking them out or it's bringing up the fear because I think when we share it and when we are able to voice the, the emotions that naturally come along with it, we realize that we're not alone. We realize we're not the only one who feels that way, but also that this, this movement we feel inspired to be a part of is not about us. It's 100% about who it will impact in the process. And you're such a great reminder of all of that. So I have one final question for you, and this is a fun one, especially in this season where it has been a challenging year for a lot of us. Mm. Um, But I think especially in those seasons, it's important to pause and acknowledge our own greatness, acknowledge the Mm. places where we show up as our most powerful, our best selves, even in the small things. So the question is really simple. We just call those moments your powerhouse moment. So what's something in the last week or two or the last month where you look back and you're like, wow, I was a total powerhouse in in that moment, in that situation? Wow. I am a person that needs to do more self-reflection, right? 
you know, it's kind of um, practicing getting off that hamster wheel. I am always ready for like every question, but this one is like, it's challenging a little bit, right? I know. I, I struggle with it too. Yeah. But I, I think for me is I, I have a a full-time job and, um, you know, movement maker in the platform is, is my passion project, my right now, my side hustle and in making that shift, which I switch from a nonprofit role to a different type of lobbying role in December, um, I questioned myself a lot, not my work ethic, not my intention, but I came from this workplace where people, um, oh, which this also made me just think of something else, which I should have, but anyway, um, where people really put out your light to shine bright because they could not handle, you know, just know those people that like, they got to take a little from you so that they can be like, and so I just, I worked in that environment for 16 years. And you, if you are a person that um, finds your, finds things to come very easy, you start to just make yourself really small um, because then you're not a target. And so I promised myself I was not going to do that in my next iteration in life because every time we start a movement or we start a new movement from within, you get to reinvent yourself a little bit and you owe it to yourself to reinvent yourself a little bit because you learn something every time. And so I think I am most proud of myself and just owning that. And I found myself earlier this week telling someone, hey, like, that they were not allowing me to use all of me and all of my talents and was able to say it from a place that did not feel defensive, that did not feel awkward. And where they just said, yeah, I'm going to hand you that baton. And so I think I tell that story because for anyone that's listening, if they are afraid to just say, um, I got this, it's okay. This is a moment in time where um, people are embracing the opportunity to let others shine. Mm, Oh my goodness. That was so beautifully said. What a perfect way to put the actual bow on this. (laughs) And I'm so grateful for this time and for you bringing your fire to the powerhouse women community. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. This is so much fun. You just gave me energy. I'm ready to go.